Annie Lobert, welcome to the Chad Sylvia Show. Hey! I'm so excited, Chad. What's up? Well, I'm actually, I'm very thrilled to have you. This may be, and this may end up being the, the easiest interview I've ever done because your story is so fascinating. Your story is so inspiring. And from what I understand, there's a lot to tell about your story that I, you know, I just want to ask you some questions and hear what you have to say. It's going to be easy for me. Um, oh, that's, you're cheating. That's not fair, Chad. Like, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> well, here to, to set this up for people who who may have not you know come across information about you, which you know if you you search online, I found a lot of information about you. You're you're out there all over the place. You've been on television shows, obviously radio shows. You have a good presence on you know the social media sites and the internet. But basically, you are like I said, Annie Lobert. You are the founder of a, a ministry, I would say, uh, called Hookers for Jesus. Yes. And you also are the wife of the lead guitarist for Striper, Oz Fox. That's right. My husband is an amazing, talented, determined guitar player. Okay? He's insane. He plays guitar. If, if I could say to you how many times I see him with the guitar in his lap, like when I first got married to him, he was like, I was like, hey, listen, um, I'm, I'm like wondering what it feels like to be a guitar in your hands. Like... <laughs> I mean, it's shaped like a woman, some of them, right? So, like, they're very feminine. They have curves, yes. Yes, they're very curvy. And he just has such a passion. And that is my baby. That's Oz Fox. I should say my baby. Um, I call him Ozzy Bears. So he's my little bear. And um, trust and believe that, you know, we have a great relationship. We've been married 10 years now, and, and it's going strong. Well, that's awesome here. And I have a confession to make I am a huge Striper fan and a fan of your husband. So. Oh, you are. Is that how you got a hold of us? Or well, did you I, I found out about you because I follow Oz. Oh, and okay. When you got married and your story started to come out, I always from the get go thought, this is an amazing story. This is absolutely amazing. And finally I'm like, you know what? I've got to book her on my show. I gotta to talk to her. Book him, Danum, book him, Danum. Well, we got it. So here's my first question. Here's the beginning point. And it's, I guess it's a question, it's a statement, well, however you want to take it. But I want you to tell myself and my listeners your story. Just start at the beginning. You know, wherever you think it started, wherever you think it begins, your journey, your testimony, just tell it however you feel fit. Well, okay, how much time y'all got? I will take okay. as much time as you want. I am well, here. Well, you're going to have to divide this up in five or six shows then. How about <laughs> it? Well, okay, so no, I won't do that to you, I promise, but. Well, let's just cut to the chase. Okay. If anyone does not know about me, I am Annie Lobert. And like Chad said, I am the founder of Hookers for Jesus. But the only uh, thing that I want to share, like to really drive home today is that the adult inter entertainment industry is not what you think it is. Absolutely. Okay. You can look at it from a distance. You can look at the strip clubs. You can watch, you know, you can buy a Playboy magazine, which they've changed their policies now. You can buy a Hustler. You can watch porn, which we have access 24-7 on our phones now. And you have no idea what it's really about unless, unless you are either a trafficker pimp, you are a girl or a, a boy or a woman or a man that's being sold. Or you are the person that owns the building where all the trafficking is going down and you are like an entrepreneur and you're using the sex industry as a tool to make a bunch of money and you're allowing people to use your facilities. So basically for me, I never grew up thinking, hey, I'm going to be uh, a stripper. I'm going to be an exotic dancer one day. I am going to be a call girl. I'm going to be a high class call girl. I never dreamt in a million years. Okay, because of course we don't even live a million. So how do I even say that? Where does that saying come from, Chad? Come on. Got you. No, I'm reading you. I'm reading you. Come on, man. Well, Maybe it'll 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 like resonate with someone out there. Well, but where did where did exactly? Because you know, obviously, you know, you 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 became all those things. You became a prostitute. You became a high end call girl, or however you want to refer to it as. Yes, pretty woman, pretty woman. That's what I was. How did how did how did that journey? begin because obviously you know for something like that to happen you know honestly any of our lives any of our journeys you know there's a domino effect where did oh, the first domino fall 
So the first domino is always with all, most of sex industry workers, I would say. And I don't even like to call them that because a lot of the women and men are, they're being trafficked. They're hu human slaves, basically. There's an estimate of, you know, well, I, I think the stat is so outdated, the 27 million thing. And I think that was just the tip of the iceberg across the world for labor and sex trafficking. So first of all, let's define what it is. And then I'm going to tell you my background on how it happened real quickly. Okay. So sex trafficking is a human trafficking and, and human trafficking is anytime we use someone for our own personal gain and we use them as an object. Okay. For our monetary gain or our well-being gain or our, our favor, right? It's human trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation, including sex slavery. A victim will be forced in a variety of ways. By the way, there's 25 different ways of trafficking. Go look on Polaris.com into a situation of dependency on their trafficker, AKA pimp, and then used by the trafficker or pimp to give sexual services to other customers. That's what sex trafficking is. Okay. okay. So, and you know, always, there's always a, a geo, a geogram, right? In other words, a family history of abuse or a pattern in the person's lifestyle that is contributing to the choice of choosing or the job choosing you because of poverty. So, and I'm not shift blaming any uh, type of government or anything else like that, but here's the truth and raw deal of what happened to me is that I was a very um, scared little girl and my father was physically abusive to us children. I had a sister and two brothers. He had actually, I have another brother that I've never physically met. I've met him over the phone that he had uh, another relationship with, a, with another woman that he was married to prior to marrying my mom. And he got divorced and then remarried my mom. And my daddy was an alcoholic, full blown, drank himself to sleep, basically, right. every night. That's just the way he rolled. And my mom took a stand. He faltered a little bit off and on, but I distinctly remember very at a very young age, him drinking and getting sober. And then he went away to AA for 30 days and he came back sober. But my dad did not continue the AA program and he was completely sober for the next 42 years, maybe a little longer, maybe it was about 40, 46 years. My dad, before he passed away in 2016, in 2013, 14, he started drinking beer again. Mm. Just went downhill from there. Right. And my dad eventually died of a, his heart gave out on him and his pancreas. So it's from well, drinking and also know, heart disease. I, I know, you know, firsthand alcoholism, it destroys not only your health, but destroys your relationships, destroys your family, destroys your walk with God. Now, um, your father, I, I, you know, I want to ask like specifically since you know we, we started there sort of with your relationship with your father did your father because i know you want, i know you have a lot to say about pornography which i really want to talk about because i think it has a lot to do with your journey but not just your journey but a lot of people's journey in the wrong direction but did your father ever expose you to pornography were you exposed to pornography as a young child no now what Although are your I thoughts do on I do pornography yeah, specifically uh well back then i remember seeing a magazine uh, from one of my neighbors that she actually uh, sexually did some weird things to me and uh, abused me. And they had pornography in their house with many different toys. Okay. Right. So that in itself affected me very greatly as well, because I had, anytime you get a sexual, uh, you know, abuse that happens to you, you become very afraid number one number two you blame yourself number three shame comes and creeps in and tells you lies okay that are you know monstrous lies about who you are as a person in other words it makes you feel like you're a bad person like you are the abuse that happened to you right yeah it's now, really it's really serious now what would you say to people because here's the thing I've seen firsthand pornography destroy 
and it is so prevalent now. It's everywhere. It's a click away. It's a swipe away. It's everywhere. Like, what would you say to those people? Because there's a lot of, you know, you're obviously you're a follower of Jesus. You have a ministry. Um, what what would you say to people who say that porn really it's not that big a deal or it doesn't affect anybody else but themselves? No, that's not true. You see, pornography opens the doorways to all kinds of different types of addictions that go into deeper addictions. And also it changes your thought patterns and your brain. It actually rewires your brain to expect a certain type of experience that in all reality in life, you could never really experience. So you can imagine the dysfunction of a poor guy, let's say, or even a woman trying to enjoy a sexual relationship when they've watched it on their phone for so long, or they've watched it on their television for so long, trying to imitate that sexual relationship and become perfected in that. That's impossible because porn only shows a show. It's not the real thing. It's a, it's a personified, acted out relationship or sexualized abuse going on repeatedly between two adults or three or four or five if it's an orgy, right? Right. And and so how do you because there's always a soul and a and a heart attached to a relationship. The real people, how do you separate that? Porn does not allow you to have that. Right. Now also I, I from my perspective, I, I think that it also does something that's very unnatural. You know, God created us to, to live in a certain way in all areas of life, including relationships. But one of the things that it does is unnatural. It puts our focus on other individuals constantly instead of the one that we're with or the spouse that we're with. And it right. becomes a perpetual situation where there's constant focus sexually and sometimes even otherwise on another person instead of your spouse or who you're with. Right. Right. And you're emotionally cheating on that person. You're still cheating. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you did not touch that other person. That fantasy is in your head. And what did Jesus say about that? Exactly. He said, if you even look on another woman. Yeah, you're in, absolutely. You're in sin. So what are we doing, you guys? Like, let's stop this madness. Like, this is the other part that porn is just so uh, terrible that it does is it, it, it actually will destroy your sex life because you won't even, and I, and I say this to all the men out there, you won't even be able to get aroused because you're so used to a certain type of image. Yes. And your wife or your, you know, your better half is sitting there going, what's going on? You can't even perform. Like, what kind of relationship is that? No, it's, no it's, 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 an un, it's an unnatural relationship that, it is. that causes issues. And most people don't view it that way. And to me, one of the things that I have a passion for is, and I, and I, I really don't do much about this, and I, I, I wonder what I can do with this in the future, but it kind of burns inside my brain and my heart about talking more about pornography with, with Christians. Because... I think there's so many Christians who just, they don't see it as the issue that it is. And so I think there's a, and that's why I respect, one of the reasons I respect what you do is because I know, I asked the question, but I know how you feel about pornography and it impresses me because many Christians won't speak out about it or will speak out about it, but then go home and watch it. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, right. it's an issue. So I think it's, it's an yeah. untapped ministry and that's hookers for Jesus, which obviously I want to get into hookers for Jesus. But the thing I want to clarify before I move into more about your ministry is, so basically, you know, you had situations growing up, the path went the way it went, you became a call girl. Can, let's start there. So you're entering the world of prostitution. Take it from there. Right. So, and that's, that was a whole setup. And I wanted to share, Chad, if we can, if people want the very very nitty gritty details where it was just explained profoundly is in my book that I wrote called Fallen Out of the Sex Industry and Into the Arms of the Savior. So that will be uh, on our website when we get done with this uh, radio interview too. They can go click it and get the book. But what I did want to just, I want to just piggyback off the last thing you said about pornography. Sure, go ahead. Pornography actually creates demand for sex trafficking. Okay. Okay. And many of the women are being trafficked that are being, that are porn stars and some of the men. Yes. Many of them are, are my friends as well. So 
Um, how did I get into that? What happened on my first call? How did I turn my first trick, as they say? How? What led up to that? Well, of course, I'm just going to cut to the chase. I went out. I was trying to go to college. My girlfriend and I were out at the clubs one night. We had both had fake identifications. I was still a teenager, Chad, 18 years old. Okay. I'm in the club. The drinking age is 21 across the nation. It had just changed to 21 and I'm in the club with a fake ID. And these two men walked in. A lot of people know my story, but let's hear it again, because you need to know this ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Out there in those clubs, there are traffickers and pimps looking for you to slip a Mickey in your drink, to con you into another lifestyle, to, to propose a business entrepreneurship. And they're going to pull on your, your ideas and your fantasies about your future or your plans about your future. So that's what these guys did is they looked for what we were looking to do with our lives. One of the guys started talking to my girlfriend, bought us drinks. They lied, said that they were entrepreneurs and maybe not entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs in the dark realm because they were traffickers. They had, they claimed they had a car lot and they owned real estate and that they could teach us how to make money. But that was a lie. They sure could teach us how to make money, but they wouldn't teach us how to do real estate or, or have our own car lock because these guys were circuit pimps. They were traffickers. They had houses in a bunch of different cities. They had women in a bunch of different cities and they were all networked. They had houses in Vegas, in Minnesota, in Chicago, in Baltimore, in Hawaii, in California. Okay. And I'm not sure if they had one in Florida or not, but let me just tell you that these men were very connected. Uh, there was no internet back then, although everything they did was underground. Okay. So my girlfriend takes off with one of the guys and she goes to Hawaii and he has a friend, another pimp that taught her with their bottom girl, which the bottom girl is the main girl in the stable, in the, in the stable of women for one pimp. And that means she's like the head chick and she's been there the longest. Usually that's not always the case, but usually she has the most information about the pimp and all the girls that are in the stable. And the stable is just another word for folks or family. Okay. In the pimp language and the traffic language. So she goes there and she learns. And then she calls me up and says, girl, I got this great idea. You need to come to Hawaii. You're not going to believe what I'm doing. You, I'm making like thousands of dollars. And I was like, what? And Chad in 1987, that was music to my ears. I understand. I bet. You need to double the amount of money. Okay. So if you think about it right now, how many years ago? That's about 33 years ago now. 32 years ago, right? Yes. Or is it 20? I don't know. No, I, I trust your math. I hate math. I'll just trust it. Yeah. Okay, yes. Money. So if I, yes. If I gave you a, a $500 a payment today or a thousand, double it. So when she said thousands, you say multiple thousands now, right? right? So if I tell you I made 20 grand in one night, it's 40 grand wow. in today's standards, right? Wow. So she tells me, girl, I'm making minimum 500 bucks a call. I'm making sometimes 1500. Sometimes I'm making 5,000. Come out here, girl. You got to check out what's going on. So double that. Okay. And I was blown away because at this point in my life, I'm working at investors, diversified services, AKA American express. Okay. Head office in downtown Minneapolis. And I had already gotten promoted once. I was about to get promoted for the second time in my job. I was a very good steward. I had two other jobs, by the way, wanted to go to college. My parents didn't have money. That's another whole story that's in my book, by the way. And so I decided to fly to Hawaii, got my $500 ticket. And I will never forget the first day when I landed in Waikiki beach at the Honolulu airport, because the air smelled different. I had never really seen the ocean in my life mm. before. Okay. I had been to Florida one time, but I had never gotten to see the ocean. So to see the ocean on Oahu was probably the biggest treat I ever had in my life. I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. 
I was like, oh my gosh, is this the life I'm missing? And all it was literally, oh my gosh, I, it explains it so well. It was literally like Dorothy on the Wizard of Oz. When she came out of that tornado, everything prior was black and white. And when I stepped off that plane, I was in living color. Mm. And I felt like I was in this place that I could never leave. I felt just all these fuzzy feelings. I was excited about my life. I, I didn't care, you know, what anyone thought at the time. I was, you know, I had a very cute little face and body back then. I mean, I'm a teenager still blossoming into a woman. You know, they say, the scientists say that our brains don't physically, some of us form until fully until we're 25. Yeah, I see that. I, I, I agree with that. Yes. And so to make the decisions that I made back then, were they adult decisions? Now with a traumatized brain, now think about this. I had, I probably had complex trauma, didn't even know it, had a lot of insecurities. I had a self hate for myself back then. My looks was everything. You know, what I, what I could use with my body was everything. Money was something to me. Madonna had just became super famous. She was singing about material world, material girl, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and, and borderline and, uh, you know, all these great songs, Cindy Lauper, George Michael, you know, um, oh my gosh, Prince came out. Michael Jackson got super famous in the eighties. So I, and Striper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite. And, yeah, I'm, I've got all this music in front of me, and it's a change in our economy. Our economy was on the upswing. Reagan was president. It was a crazy time for entrepreneurship, okay? Crazy time, right? Yes. And so the money was doing really well. The Japanese economy was booming, and they were all coming to Hawaii. Mm. And so the only people that I saw, men that I saw, were Japanese men. First nut that I worked, I did not have a pimp. The first year I worked, I did not have a pimp. I did not have a trafficker. Heck no. But I got back to Minnesota with my thousands of dollars. And I had a reason that I came to Hawaii. I actually was in love with a man from the Air Force. It's a funny thing because my dad was in the Air Force too. And he broke my heart. He moved to California because actually... His Air Force branch, his four-year stay up in Minnesota was done. And he had to go because they were calling him to Riverside, California. So I got to see Riverside, California for the first time in my life. Ho Hollywood, you know, uh, of course, the famous Rodeo Drive with Beverly Hills. And I was blown away by that too. But the only way I could go see this guy was to have more money than I was making. Which, by the way, I was making when I first started working, Chad. Three dollars and forty-seven cents an hour, dude. I remember those days. I remember oh my those gosh. Days. And that was like minimum wage, right? Yeah. It was like that was what it was back then. And but my waitress jobs, I'd make a little bit more. I mean, I rem I remember making fifty to a hundred dollars in tips a night at my waitress job. I was working at a Japanese restaurant, high class restaurant. It was I actually loved that job. That job was so fun because I got to serve food to teppanyaki tables. And sushi. It was great. Well, you know, it's so funny. Not not to sidetrack you, but you know, some of the most, you know, what most people think benign jobs can be some of the most rewarding. Like, I, one of my favorite jobs of all time. My dad owned gas stations. I used to wash cars and change oil, and it, it was. Oh my god! It was very rewarding. I love it. Oh, that's so amazing, dude. I mean, that's a great business to be in if you own a bunch of gas stations. Cause that 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 actually can make you a lot of money. You know, if you well, the eighties really were good people. to my dad as well. As you, it, it's resonating. Yeah. The eighties were very good to him. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and of course we're, we're kind of switching now to power stations because some of our cars, I actually have a hybrid myself. I am into hybrids and, uh, our gas is hopefully going to phase out soon because it's destroying our world. Right. Yes. <laughs> but you know, I just really, really had this entrepreneurial spirit and I just really wanted to make it in my life. I wanted to go to college. So I thought, well, Hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this job just for a couple months, but no, that turned into more months. And then I started working the escort services in Minnesota, got scared to death, started stripping. And that, you know, I remember the place I was at, I was on Hennepin Avenue 
at the Skyway Lounge, which now it's called Spearmint Rhino. They purchased that building and that club, actually. And all the businessmen would come to my shows and we had like three 20 minute sets. And back then you couldn't get off the stage. You had to stay on the stage and dance. And this man walks in that turned into my boyfriend, turned into my trafficker. And I had no idea he was an undercover pimp. Mm. And I had no idea he, he was actually dealing cocaine. I found out about it and I tripped out. I was like, you can't do that anymore. Let's go to Vegas. My girlfriend was in Vegas, the one that went to Hawaii. Her pimp had a house here. So I decided to bring him with me to Las Vegas. And the first night that I worked, I got sex trafficked, brutally sex trafficked by him. He beat me down mm. like there's no one's business. And I actually stayed with this man for five years wow. and had girls. He would bring girls home that were 14 and 13 and 15 years old. And once I found out how old they were, because he had fake IDs made for them too, I would like get them a ticket home to their house. Like I freaked out. I, I, I was like, what are we doing? What's going on? And like, I never took any of their money. He was the one that was the pimp, but I couldn't do anything about it because he would beat me down and he would threaten my life and he had guns and it was an awful lifestyle. Let me tell you what pimps do to girls in the industry. It is very deathly what happens. There's different types of pimps. There's the Romeo finesse and there is the gorilla pimp. And I had a gorilla pimp. The gorilla pimp is the one that gets very violent. You know, they economically abuse you. They use coercion and threatening your family. They use severe intimidation. You know, they harm you and, and, and maybe one of your pets or they'll hold one of your child hostages. So I was used to that in my life, even though I vowed I would never allow anyone to do that to me. You know, he would shame me and, and, and say that, you, you know, I'd have to work every day of the week, Chad, even on Christmas. Okay. Mm. Um, and then he would it, deny that I was, that he was abusive and he would minimize the abuse. Like, oh, it's your fault. You wanted it, you know? And, and then he would sexually abuse me when I wouldn't give him my way or do what I wanted. He would take it. He would rape. Okay. Mm. And then the physical abuse was off the flipping chain, dude. It was off the chain. Okay. Like he would choke me out, rape me, choke me out. I would pass out and he'd be gone. And then of course he would take every single dollar that I made. So when people say to me, well, you chose the adult entertainment industry as a lifestyle. Yes, I did in the beginning, but after meeting the wrong people and being in the wrong places at the wrong time, you eventually run into traffickers and there's pimps everywhere that limo drivers, the, the, uh, brothel owners, the massage parlor owners, the strip club owners, the limo drivers, the, the bartenders, the door concierge, the hotel concierge, the, the pit boss dealers and casinos. There's people everywhere that are getting a cut out of you selling yourself. And they're all part of the problem. Okay. So at this point in time, at this point in time, you're at the depths of hell. You know, you're, you're working as a prostitute. And I'm in Las Vegas and I, and and I'm a call girl because you couldn't tell me I was a prostitute because I was high class uh -huh. in it. I would only go to nice hotels on the strip. I worked for the top escort agency at the right. time for the decade in Las Vegas. It was called Strippers Elite. And I also worked for Star Entertainment, which they both just went out of business. Um, they were the top echelon industry. Like we would get calls from Hollywood elites and, you know, political figures, coaches, sports figures, famous people. And Chad, if you heard some of the people that I saw, you would be shocked. And also Hollywood elite that actually have, some have passed away already that I knew that were calling the escort services that were clients of mine. Mm. Now, so, so as you're working, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. They were all participating. And did they know I had a pimp? Absolutely not. I never shared with them that I had a mm. pimp. And I actually had two pimps. I had another pimp for another five years. So I was uh, trafficked for 10 years. So what was, on the what was the turning point? Like, when does, when does this all start to change for you? Because right now, what I'm hearing is just, like I said, the depths of hell. 
and what and when, how did it start to change? So I have a background in being a Lutheran. Okay. And I love Lutheranism, by the way. I do. I don't practice it anymore. I am now just a regular believer of Christianity and, of course, Jesus. But I had this background going to Sunday school. I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was five. I really got serious, more serious about my faith when I was eight, nine years old, when I was being sexually abused by my neighbor because I went to a parochial Lutheran school called Trinity, Trinity Life, First Trinity Life. And, but my actual belief in God kind of faded because of all the crazy things that had happened in my life. And so I considered myself an agnostic. I, I wanted proof to believe God was real. But God kept showing up in little places in my life, mm -hmm. little instances where I should have died. And I actually was drug free for the first decade of my career being trafficked. It sounds crazy, right? I drank once in a while, but I never did painkillers. I never did cocaine. I never did heroin. But towards like the 11th year, and I call it the 11th hour, <laughs> I started abusing cocaine. I tried cocaine for the first time on I'll never forget it. April 17th, 1997, I tried cocaine. Crazy, right? Crazy. And uh, maybe it was 98. Anyway, whatever year it was, I got instantly hooked, Chad. Oh, yeah. I couldn't put it down. So the, the day that I finally quit everything, because I, I quit for a couple years, got sober. I had a trick rescue me out of the industry. Again, get the book. You'll have way more detail. Had a failed business and... Uh, I ended up doing drugs again and I started going down back to the strip selling myself. And on August 2nd, which that date's coming up soon, 2003, I overdosed on cocaine mm. for the second time in one week and I had a heart attack, went to the hospital, ambulance came, cried out to Jesus. I saw my body in a coffin. I literally had what I consider a near death visualized, visualized experience where I saw my death before my eyes. And I decided I would pray and just say, Jesus, help me. Mm. Help me, Jesus. I, I can't do this anymore. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I want my life back. I don't even know what my life is. Can you show me who I am? Can I be Annie again? You know, I wanted to be, you know, at this point in my life, Chad, I actually had a name. My name was Fallon York. That was my alter ego. And we all pick a sex industry name when we're in the sex industry. So that was my name, Fallon. And people had called me Fallon for so long. I didn't know who Annie was anymore. Mm. Annie Lori Lobert needed to re be reborn. And that's what happened that day. Well, God is amazing. And I, obviously, you know, I have different experiences than you and all of our listeners have, might have different experiences, but one thing remains the same. No matter where you're at, you know, God comes down to you and he, he offers not only protection, but deliverance. And it's just amazing to your story. It, it has been amazing. And Chad, you know, as well as I do, once Jesus, Jesus gets a hold of your heart, I decided to never let go and never let him let go of me. And it's been like that passionate, nonstop, just driving force in my life to do what I do today. To, I, I believe this path has been created by God and I had the ability to choose it or refuse it. And I chose it. And you're doing amazing and, and things wanna, with it. Um, talk about hookers yeah, for Jesus. Wanna, to, what, what is, what is your yeah, ministry wanna, entail? Okay, so so I want to speak to someone. Her, I feel like someone's listening right now. I want to say something okay, first. Sorry, I interrupt a lot. I have a really aggressive personality. You speak at Sorry will. You're good. Type A, type A, right? <laughs> okay, so anyone out there that just heard what I said, you can choose a new path. Amen. Your addictions, your porn addiction, your drinking, your drug addiction, your pill popping, your psychotropic mm. addiction, because your doctors think you need mm. it. You can choose a new path of healing. There is a path for you and God has it laid out. You just have to have faith. So I, I just hope I can give some hope to someone. So hookers for Jesus, this was formed as I was driving my car, but also, it, Hey, this sounds crazy to some people, but I prayed Chad and I prayed for Jesus to show up 
in my dreams. I dream every night. I have beautiful, colorful dreams and they give me such insight into my life and my healing. And it's a constant journey healing from trauma, by the way. I never, ever think I'm fully healed. I know I am in the spirit. I am fully healed because of Jesus. However, there is, there are the flesh parts of me in my brain that need to be awakened. And so that's up the journey that I'm on constantly. And so God's always giving me great things. So one of my healings was this, Jesus basically said to me, you know, in his beautiful voice, which I didn't, you know, in my dream, I was just like, Whoa, he told me I was healed. And he said that he wanted me to go down to the Las Vegas strip and tell his daughters that he loves mm. them. Wow. And it was that simple. And so one day I'm driving in my car and I'm crying because I'm realizing, oh my gosh, I feel like, you know, God's got me doing something. This is like maybe 2004 ish. And that's where the name comes from. And I remember being criticized and arrested by police and uh, security guards at the hotels, getting kicked out of all the hotels on the strip because obviously we're a nuisance, you know, girls that are working are a nuisance to them. And some of them are, you know, they, they kick the pimps out, they kick the girls out. And some of them would call me derogatory names, you know, you're just a hooker, or you're just a hoe or just a slut or just a whore. And I heard in the, just like this still small voice that said, you're my hooker. You're my little fisher girl. You're my righteous, holy hooker. Like it sounds crazy, right? Yeah. So in other words, I am God's fish hook to help women get out of. Sex well, this is not, this doesn't sound crazy to me at all because you know, there's that often quoted, you know, what would Jesus do if Jesus were on the earth right now, he would be going to those people in those situations directly and trying to touch them. And he did. You're, working, you're doing his work. Let me, let me get real deep here. Woo. Let me get deep because the first four disciples were fishermen. He called them and said, come follow me. I will make you fishers of people. Now, back then the rabbi, the rabbi would choose his students, his disciples. And these men were all doing the family business because guess what they, what happened to them as students under rabbis, they were rejected by the rabbis and the rabbis would say, come follow me. And they would purposely pick them out. Now, Jesus was considered a rabbi from a lot of different people, even if it wasn't solidified with the rabbis. So when he said to these rejects, come follow me and I will teach you how to fish for people. They were like, what? He's a rabbi. What? I'm going to follow this guy. I, I, he's going to teach me how to fish for people. So that's what hookers for Jesus is based on Matthew four nineteen. I will teach you how to fish for people. And I actually, you know, started doing outreaches in 2015 to the strip, to the girls on the Las Vegas Strip in the casinos, giving them my card at first and eventually stamping our name Hookers for Jesus on the card. And I officially filed for the, the first business side of our business in 2006. And then I dissolved it because it was a sole proprietorship and I turned it into a nonprofit in 2007. So it's been active and retroactive since uh, 2007. Now, what specifically do you do with and for the prostitutes that you, you, you reach out to? So I basically, it, it started as a simple outreach where I meet them where they're at. I go to the strip and I go to the casinos and I talk to them and tell them that they have a way out if they don't want to be with their trafficker anymore. Like I would say 90 to 95% of my friends all had traffickers. So a, a very high percentage of women that are in this industry are being pimped out and tricked out and they're being trafficked by traffickers. So anyone that's calling escorts, hey guys, wake up, wake up guys. A lot of these girls will lie to you and tell you that they don't have a pimp, mm. but they do. And you are, you are contributing this to the sex trafficking monster that it is. So stop it right now. I say, stop it. Stop buying women. Stop buying little boys and girls. It's, it's not helping the kingdom. So anyway, um, <laughs> I had to get a little fire there for a second. I appreciate that. But, but, you know, um, I, I just have to say this because, you know, we, we started doing this outreach and I started giving the girls services, giving them rides, 
helping them get their children into daycare, helping them find jobs. I was basically not realizing what I was doing back then, Chad, but I was doing basic social service case management. I was doing that, helping the girls. And then in 2007, the idea with birth to have a home for women called Destiny House, where women can come and dream again, get rid of their nightmares from all their past and all their mistakes and all the complex trauma, discover who they are, discover their purposes, develop into those purposes, and then go into their true destiny that God originally designed them for, which is greatness, adventure, changing the world for good. So that's what Destiny House is. Dream, discover, develop your destiny. Well, I mean, do you ever right? stop thinking about like you? As far as I know, you're like the first person who's ever done anything like this that, that I know of. Like, do you ever stop and think about that? Well, we are the first in the country that I know of of a survivor-led safe house, and I believe the first survivor-led safe house in the country as well. Faith based as well. If only, if only more people, and, and that's one of the reasons I want to talk to you because I think it's inspiring, it's encouraging. It, you know, if only more people did the type of things that you're doing, and it's just amazing to me what you've done. Um, I do want to pause for one second because there's a segment of every show that I do, and um, I call it One Question with Violet. I have a beautiful nine year old little girl, and she loves to ask all my guests one question. So I'm going to bring her into the studio to ask you a question. Now, what I'm going to do is I want you to be able to answer freely whatever question she asks you, and I can kind of transcribe later. Um, so I'm going to have her leave the studio after she asks you the question so you can answer it any way that you want because I know there's a lot of sensitive subject matter. So if you don't mind, let me go grab her real quick. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Annie. I've got my just my the apple of my eye right next to me. She just turned nine years old this you know a few days ago. She's a beautiful little blonde. I know you're a blonde, so maybe you guys can relate. But anyway, her name is Violet. Hi, Violet. <laughs> and here's here she is. She's gonna ask you one question. One question with Violet. How important is the relationship between a daddy and a daughter? Violet, that is such amazing intelligent and beautiful question it is so important violet let me just tell you that when a daughter and a father love each other and a father shows his daughter protective uh just en encompassing love and and also teaches her at the same time how to be a young lady going into adulthood, into womanhood. It is the most precious commodity in a family that I could ever fathom. It's literally like platinum, better than gold. It is so important that a daughter and a father have a good relationship because if that does not happen, Violet, you know what happens to little girls? This is what happens. We don't know who we are. And so we are going to go out into the world and look to boyfriends and get boy crazy and look to older men to become our father because we never had that great relationship, that loving, nurturing, protective relationship between us and our father. We're going to try to find it somewhere else. And the other boys or men will not know how to handle our hearts because they will see the hurt and men that are not nice and a little bit evil and a little bit lustful and greedy will take advantage of that, that extra vacuum and brokenness inside of us because we didn't have that good relationship. And they will be, try to become that father and they will become actually manipulative and abusive. And we can be open to being abused emotionally, mentally, physically, and sexually, and possibly exploited, sex trafficked. That's what can happen if you don't have a good relationship with your daddy. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I, I um, discussed with her, you know, what she was going to ask you. And I thought it was such a great question because, you know, I have, you only know, have one daughter, but I've always kind of witnessed and I always thought, well, maybe you're wrong, maybe you're right, but don't take any chances that I saw a lot of troubled girls growing up did not have an attentive father. And I vowed yep. to never be that type of dad with her 
And I just wanted to know how you felt because of your story and where, what you've gone through. And that was, that was really beneficial to my daughter and to our listeners. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I, I, what I like to tell people when I do speaking sessions and I give people advice about relationships is the fact that if you have time to date your daughter, okay, and show her what it's like to be treated. And don't take this in a weird way. Not it's no, there's no sexual thing involved with this answer, but treat her like a lady would be treated. Open the door, bring flowers, Mm -hmm. take her to the movie, you know, buy her a nice little dress, just in the way that, you know, she would feel loved and encouraged, you know, the right way a man would treat a woman. And by the way, teaching her also about boundaries with dating as she gets older, when she comes to that point, how a man is supposed to treat a young woman. Okay. And when you train her up like that and you teach her and you model it yourself, how you treat her and how you love her, she will not settle for anything else. Her brain is being hardwired for love when you're training her up like that. And so she's going to know what love looks like. So if she doesn't know what it looks like, Chad, what's going to happen is she's going to go try to find out what it looks like. And it's not going to be the right kind of love. It's going to be an unhealthy vacuum type of love where it's never fulfilled. You know, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. You know, your ministry, you know, I think that just your ministry obviously encompasses like, you know, even interviews like this, you know, people hearing you talk and your perspective and, you've got a right to your perspective so you're credible and people can respect what you say because they know where you've come from. But you talking about that relationship with a daddy and a daughter, you know, I homeschool my daughter. I try to spend as much time as possible. I try to teach her about, you know, God and and ensure my love any way I can. And it's so foreign in today's day and age. I mean, it, it seems that it's very rare for that type of relationship to even exist anymore. Um, but maybe people hearing, you know, your ministry, your, your te- about your ministry, about your testimony, maybe even like relationships could change in that way as well. Um, I think so. But speak- Wake up, America. <laughs> but speaking of relationships, <laughs> let's talk about your husband for a minute, if that's okay. Yeah, Oz is uh, my husband and, and I love him. And we met on MySpace. I know that sounds ridiculously crazy, but we did. No, you know, in today's day and age, and- some of the kids might think that sounds old school, you know, MySpace. That's a- it is old school. It is old school because I remember getting on my computer and you could not use your phone to post. You had to have your laptop open or your your PC at home. It, you could not just go, I'm going to post today. No, you have to go sit down, turn the computer on, fire it up, and then you have to plan your post. So MySpace was ingenious back for its time. It was better than Facebook. Don't get mad at me, Facebook, for saying that. But Facebook was just being invented and they were, it's a, it was a very low following back then. And so MySpace was a place where you could put your music, you could put your likes and all your pictures. It's like a miniature website for you and all your tastes and all whatever you wanted on your, your page. And it, it was a place where people could comment and conversate and they could inbox you just like Facebook. But it, it was just a really different type of, uh, place and you could display your friends. I mean, your friends could be thousands, uh, displayed if you wanted to, you could just display the top 100 or 40 or 10, or I only think I had four. I still have four on my top friends actually, which is crazy. But Oz and I became friends on MySpace, and he started emailing me and I was like, who is this guy? And then he showed me he was from Striper and I thought, Oh, this is one of those musicians mm-hmm. again, you know? Like, what the heck? And so he invited me to a concert one day. It was Halloween. I'll never forget it because I had basically blown him off a little bit. Um, and the this, this second time I met him, well, the first time I met him, I felt pitter-patter. I mean, it was crazy. Like, he invited me to some concert in, I think it was January of 2007 or February. And I met him in person for the very first time. And then in... 2008, I went to one of his gigs here in Vegas. It was at the Las Vegas Hilton. Now it's called, I can't remember the name of the new hotel. They bought it out. I forget. I think it's called the Gateway or uh, the Westgate. That's what it's called. Okay. So I went there and Oz was there playing and we sat down 
and we had dinner after and he didn't get done with his, his gig until like two in the morning packed up. And so I had to go to church the next day. And at the time, Chad, I was actually the destiny house mom. I lived there with the girls, which said, that is something I would never recommend to anybody living at a safe house, big no, no. And you know, you're all learning, right? We learn. And so I met him and, uh, we went to church the next day and it was like, I don't want to use the word magic. It was just Holy spirit, like beautiful. It was just like, we had, we were like, I don't know. We were like made for each other. It was so crazy. Like I felt like he fit me like a glove and vice versa. And we both had tragedy in our past. And so we compared notes and stories and, you know, he had a passion for music. So did I, I, I love to listen to music as well. And I, I still have my passion to uh, sing and write. I have songs I have never produced yet that Oz is helping me with right now that I'm learning how to record. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, we fit like a glove, like I said, and, and it was a fast romance. Uh, we actually got engaged within five months, and then we got married on June 5th, 2009. Well, how has marrying a godly man like Oz Fox impacted your life? Well, I tell you, I never thought that I would have a partner or a friend, a best friend that would understand me and love me fully in all my inconsistencies and my addictions and weird behaviors and whatever else might still be left over. Right. It, and just the way we are as humans, just my human nature. Like he loves me in that space, but he loves me as the woman I'm becoming to be as well and who I've already become. Right. So he, he just loves me no matter what, that's who he is. And that in itself is very redemptive because that's how Christ yes. loves the church. And he became my best friend, we waited to have full on sex till we awesome. were married. I mean, for me, that's a rarity. Like, come on. Right. <laughs> I was engaged twice before and, and, uh, messed up or whatever, but I don't, you know, that's in the past who cares. So, and by the way, I want to encourage anyone out there. Don't let the stigma of what you've been through or what the way public thinks about what you've been through or who you used to be. AKA addict, adult entertain, entertainment industry worker, affect your now. Like that's your past and you should never be ashamed of that. God can turn it all around. It doesn't matter what it is, he can turn it all around. That's right. Like I wear it as a badge. Like what scarlet letter? This is my freaking badge, scarlet letter. What's up? You got a problem with me, well, bro? That, that's the thing. I, some of the people like, some people, no, seriously though, but some people may even look at the name of your ministry, Hookers for Jesus, and shy away from it just because it has the word hookers in it. You know what? I don't care. It's that you shouldn't care and you, you don't care, and that's what's awesome. You're afraid. Yeah, if you got a problem with their name, you're afraid to talk right. about the narrative. And the bottom line is this: you got you got a prejudice in you. Get over yourself, okay? Look beyond yourself and start looking within and say, why do I feel this type of way about this name? You know, and, and a lot of times the, there's some prejudices that have happened in your life and culture norms that you've accepted that are not true. There are paradigms that you've accepted in your, in your mind frame that are absolutely, absolutely a lie. You know, Jesus loves mm, women like absolutely. us. Absolutely. That Jesus tried to, he's trying to show us a, a, a sign, you guys. We can talk about these things. We can love mm. these people. We can love them into wholeness. Okay. The, you know what? Sometimes I feel like their darkness is the same darkness that some of our society's in because their society judges them. And that's a darkness in itself. Get out of that, dude. Stop judging people for bad decisions. Well, the is, is that the, You're making them the hypocrisy in, involved in this because a lot of people who would speak ill of hookers are the same people who'd watch pornography or exactly or purchase someone on the down low when they go to a business convention right. in another city. So we Hello. all have sin in our life and right? we, you know we Hello. need to, you know, not judge hypocritically and um one of the great things is that, you know, your ministry embraces and loves people. Now, back to your, your husband, Oz. Now, I do understand he's had some health issues recently. How's his health doing? 
He's doing okay. We get another brain scan in a, in a couple weeks. He, as some of you don't know, Oz and on August 12th had a fall. He had a major seizure and he, we found out he had two tumors in his brain and the seizure was caused by the tumors. So he is on a very strict medicine right now and he's on, he's just getting weaned off a dose it's supposedly supposed to shrink tumors. It's very powerful. And uh, he has been taking it easy, but he has been touring with Striper still. He's actually on tour with them right now again. He just left today for another tour. So it's a short one. It's only eight days. But he is uh, improving, I would say. He's lost a bunch of weight. He weighs like 160. When I met him, he weighed 168. And before he had his tumor diagnosis... He was almost 200 pounds, Chad. So his blood pressure has improved. His health has improved. He's been on keto with me. I've helped him with keto. I'm a keto queen. I know everything about it. I probably will do some classes on it soon because I became an expert. I became an expert on brain tumors too as well. <laughs> you have to be. You, you have to be. See, uh, I used to be a natural health practitioner for over a decade in a former life, right? Um so I, I'm a big right. fan of Striper. I, you know, I love your, your husband's music. Um, I don't know him personally, but, you know, I care for him as, you know, somebody from the outside looking in. And working with people with their health, um, I would encourage you to, you know, be your own decision makers and be your own advocates and make your own decisions and do research. I, I've, I've, I've come back from major health issues. I, you know, I worked with people who have come back with major health issues. Um, my wife has come back from major health issues. And we all did it by, you know, listening to our own selves and doing research and not just being told what we need to do. But one thing I'll encourage you to do for, for his health situation just as a little tip, and you can you can do it what, what you'd like. But I would research on YouTube a man named Dr. Robert Morse. Dr. Robert Morse gives out tons of free information about health and healing that are absolutely groundbreaking and amazing for any condition, including cancers and tumors. So I'm just throwing it out there. You do what you want with it, but I just wanted to, since we got on the subject, to mention that to you. Right. Yeah, he's on natural therapy. Good. Just to let you know, and it's a very powerful plant. Awesome very powerful and it's been known to it's rso if you don't know what that okay. is look it up later that's what he's on awesome. right now awesome and if you don't and, and and so anyway not to be an advocate for that but we are seeing some really good results and we're going to see the definitive result when we get those scans done so there will be a testimony awesome. coming well, god is good and god is with you um, if you're yeah. into herbs, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I consider myself an herbalist. Another great herb used in situations for tumors and cancer. You know, I'm just throwing out there for information. It's on the internet. The ch traditional Chinese medicine is their number one herb for cancer. It's called um, Prunella vulgaris. It's also called self-heal or all-heal. You can look it up. But uh, just more information for you. Got it. I'm going to look this There's up. There's actually studies at the National Institutes of Health. You can go look and it shows that people, um, they apply in studies Prunella vulgaris to tumors and they shrink rapidly and amazingly. It's it's all, it's all, the everybody, know, the government knows about it, but they don't care. You know what I mean? But that's a whole other story. Are you, well, anyway, that's a whole nother podcast. You know, you know what we can do? I'll have right? you on again and we can just talk about health stuff because it sounds like you're into it. I'm into it. We can talk about that same time. Oh, I'm totally into it. Dude, I, I, I have been a health advocate for myself before meeting Oz because I almost died. So I had to get, and I had cancer too, by the way, for two years in 95 to 97. I had chemo and radiation, mm. Chad. I lost all my hair. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I am a health advocate and I drink green juice every day. And I'm telling you, dude, God has oh. changed my life. So I drink, I, I take supplements and yeah, I'm always up to finding new things. Let's do so this. I'm let's open do this. Well, that. after the interview is over, let's schedule time to, in the future. I don't know, months out, whenever you feel you want to. Let's sit around. Seriously, let's talk about health. So let's do that. Okay. All right, Jim. Thank you. One more question about your husband, and then we'll move on to uh, you know some things about you. Know, you want to plug and, and things that are going on that you want to promote. What's going on? What's the future hold? A little sneak peek of what's up with Striper. Any hints? Anything going on? Well, well, I, I have to say that there are some really exciting things going on. I am not their spokesperson, but knowing from the inside that they are not stopping. They are continuing to create. So be expecting new things 
on the horizon and touring more touring and some really special surprises that are coming up that are the fans are going to love and we're you're going to be able to see striper in a very intimate setting and so just be prepared for some exciting things happening in the future um they're looking forward to their south america tour which by the way huge fandom okay like thousands show up for their concerts yeah, in south huge. america they Oh, they love Striper so much. And uh, they also will be going to Korea. And I'm excited about that. I'm hoping I can go too. And, you know, yeah, like I said, I can't really divulge. It's like kind of top secret because I'm in the in the uh, inside. I'm a Striper yeah. wife. <laughs> but, you know, you guys, keep your eyes open. And Oz has some exciting things oh, yeah, coming up too. Us. Yeah, you know, he just has some new things with his website and his business that he's doing. So we have some really exciting things on the horizon that, you know, when he gets better, we're going to awesome. be pursuing. Well, you definitely, so, you, you so definitely sparked my interest and in, um, I can't wait to see what's in store for both your husband and you and Striper. Now, speaking of you, uh, you. okay, so obviously, do you have any websites, do you have any places where people can go and get your book, websites for your ministry? Shoot it for us. Tell us. Yeah, just go hookersforjesus.net, like fishnet, get it? H-O-O-K-E-R-S-F-O-R-J-E-S-U-S dot net, N-E-T as in Tom. Very simple. Go there. You'll find new information. And hopefully, uh, you know, we're, we have a new website we're designing. So uh, if that happens, hopefully you'll hit that and you'll see the new one too. But we're working on that right now. And, and uh, I'm working on a bunch of things for HFJ as well. Hookers for Jesus. I, we, we have so many new things happening that I, I can't even contain what it is. It's, I, it's like, I'm a visionary. I see a lot of things and I plan a lot of things. It's just a matter of getting the right people to in, implement everything. So, so can you buy, can you buy uh, your book fallen you, on that website? Is there a different website for that? Yes. Yes, you can, because that'll actually link you to the Amazon account. Or if you want to email us at info, info at hookersforjesus.net, I actually will sell you a book and sign it with a word awesome. from God for you. Awesome. Now, speaking yeah. of, of a word from God, if you don't mind, let's give our words to God. Can you close in prayer? Sure. Sure. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much. I just... I'm so grateful to meet Chad and his entourage of his radio station today, Lord, and all the listeners out there. God, we just lift up this entire season and this entire message to you. And we just ask God that you would just speak to all of us. If anyone's out there that your heart's just being tugged at and you're like, man, you know, she really spoke and Chad really spoke to my heart about my addictions or about the struggles that I'm facing. And if, and it, Lord, I just ask for anyone out there that feels hopeless or alone, Lord, that you would remind them that they are not alone, that with you, all things are possible and all they have to do is call upon your name and that they will be delivered. And so I just speak that right now, in, you know, in, into existence and, and into this prayer atmosphere that Lord, that you would be uh, the one to remind them who they are in you and that you love them. You have an amazing plan for them, that there is a great path ahead of them. All they have to do is choose. Yes. And so Lord, we just open that up for that discussion right now with everyone's hearts right now that they would choose you and choose the right thing lord and if anyone out there right now is is needs to be delivered we just ask god that you would deliver them right now you deliver them because lord it says in the word that you died and then you rose from the dead and on the third day you came and you showed freedom to the captives. You let everyone out of the prisons, Lord. And so we just thank you right now that right now hearts are being set free. Right now locks are unchaining things. Locks are being busted off these, these walls and these, these, these bars and they're being flown open. And God says, run, run, run and walk out of there. Get out of there. And you, you are free in Jesus name. In Jesus' Amen. name, amen. amen. If there's one thing you get from this whole interview today, God can, can do anything. God can take any situation, any person, and work in them and turn it all around. Annie LeBaire, thank you so much for coming on the Chad Sylvia Show. I can't wait to talk to you in the future. You're welcome. You too, Chad. Talk to you soon.